what kind of big scientific discoveries, maybe the flavor of discoveries have been done throughout the history of the science of memory, the studying of memory? What kind of things have been like understood? Oh, there's so many. It's really so hard to summarize it. I mean, I think it's funny because it's like, when you're in the field, you can get kind of blase about this stuff. Mm -hmm. But then once I started to write the book, I was like, oh my God, this is really interesting. How did we do all this stuff? Um, um, I would say that some of the, I mean, you know, from the first studies, just showing how much we forget is mm -hmm. very important. Showing how much schemas, which is our organized knowledge about the world, uh, increase our ability to remember information, just massively increase it. Uh, studies of expertise showing how experts like chess experts can memorize so much in such a short amount of time because of the schemas they have for chess. Um, but then also showing that those lead to all sorts of distortions in memory. Mm -hmm. The discovery that the act of remembering can change the memory, it can strengthen it, mm -hmm. but it can also distort it if you get misinformation at the time. And it can also strengthen or weaken other memories that you didn't even recall. So just this whole idea of memory as an ecosystem, I think, was a big mm -hmm. discovery. Um, uh, I could go, this idea of like breaking up our continuous experience into these discrete events, um, I think was a major discovery. So the discreteness of our encoding of events? Maybe, yeah. I mean, you know, and again, there's controversial ideas right. about this, right? But it's like, yeah, this idea that, and this gets back to just this common experience of you walk into the kitchen and you're like, why am I here? And you just end up grabbing some food from the fridge. And then you go back and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I left my watch in the kitchen. That's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, is that you have a little internal model of where you are, what you're thinking about. And when you cross from one room to another, those models get updated. And so now when you're in the kitchen, you have to go back and mentally time travel back to this earlier point to remember what, what it was that you went there for. Mm -hmm. And so these event boundaries, Turns out, like in our research, and again, I don't want to make it sound like we've figured out everything, but in our research, one of the things that um, we found is is that basically, as people get older, the activity in the hippocampus at these event boundaries tends to go down. Um, and and but independent of age, if I give you outside of the scanner, you're done with the scan. I just scan you while you're watching a movie. You just watch it. You come out. I give you a test of memory for stories. What happens is you find this in incredible correlation between the activity in the hippocampus at these singular points in time, these event boundaries, and your ability to just remember a story outside of the scanner later on. So it's marking this ability to encode memories, just these little snippets of neural activity. So I think that's a big one. Mm -hmm. um, there's all sorts of work in animal models that I can get into, you know, sleep. I think there's so much interesting oh, yeah. stuff that's being discovered in sleep right now. Um, being able to just record from large populations of cells and then be able to relate that. And, you know, and I think the coolest thing gets back to this QR code thing, mm -hmm. because like what we can do now is like, I can take fMRI data while you're watching a movie, mm -hmm. or let's do better than that. Let me get fMRI data while you use a joystick to move around in virtual reality. Right? Mm -hmm. so you're in the metaverse, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But it's kind of a crappy metaverse because there's always so much metaversing you can do in an MRI scanner. Right. So you do this crappy metaversing. Mm -hmm. So now I can take a rat, record from his hippocampus and prefrontal cortex and all these areas with these really new electrodes to get massive amounts of data and have it move around on a trackball mm -hmm. in virtual reality in the same metaverse that I did and record that rat's activity. I can get a person with epilepsy who we have electrodes in their brain anyway to try to figure out where the seizures are coming from. And if it's a healthy part of the brain, record from that person, right? Mm -hmm. And I can get a computational model. Uh, and one of the one of the brand new members in my lab, Tyler Bond, is just doing some great stuff. He he, he relates computer vision models and looks at the weaknesses of computer vision models and relates it to what the brain does well. Mm, nice. um, and so you can actually take a a ground truth, you know, um, uh, code for the metaverse, basically, and you can feed in the visual information, let's say the sensory information or whatever that's coming in to a computational model that's designed to take 
real world inputs, right? And you could basically tie them all together by virtue of the state spaces that you're measuring in neural activity in these different formats and these different species and in the computational mm -hmm. model, which is just, I just find that mind blowing. You could do uh, different kinds of analyses on language and basically come up with just like the, basically it's the guts of LLMs, right? You have, you could do um, analyses on language and you could do analyses on, you know, sentiment analyses of emotions and so forth and put all this stuff together. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's almost too much, but if you do it right and you do it in a theory driven way, as opposed to just throwing all the data at the wall and see what sticks, I mean, that to me is just exceptionally powerful. So you can take fMRI data in across species and across different types of humans or conditions of humans and what find construct models that help you find the commonalities or like the, the core thing that makes somebody navigate through the metaverse, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, more or less. I mean, you know, there's a lot of details, but yes, I think, and not just fMRI, but you can relate it to, like I said, recordings from large populations of neurons that could be taken in a human or even in a non-human animal that is, you know, uh, where you think it's an anatomical homolog. So that's just mind-blowing to me. What's the uh, similarities in humans and mice? <laughs> That's what it. Smashing Pumpkins uh, were all just rats in a cage. Is that Smashing Pumpkins? <laughs> Despite all of your rage. <laughs> Is that Smashing Pumpkins, I think? All... Despite all of your rage at GIFs, you're still just a rat in a cage. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, good callback. Anyway. Good callback. See, these memory <laughs> retrieval exercises I'm so, doing are actually helping you build a lasting memory of this conversation. And it's strengthening the pic the visual thing I have of you with James Brown on stage. <laughs> Come stronger and stronger <laughs> by the second. Um, it's but anyway, hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> but animal studies work here as well. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so let's go to the. Um, so I think I've got you know great colleagues who I talk to who study memory in mice. You know, and there's some uh, um, one of the valuable things in those models is you can study neural circuits in an enormously targeted way because you could do these genetic studies, for instance, where you can manipulate like particular groups of neurons and it's just getting more and more targeted to the point where you can actually turn on a particular kind of memory just by activating a particular set of neurons that was active during an experience, right? So there's a lot of conservation of some of these neural circuits across, you know, um, evolution in mammals, for instance. Um, and then you know, some people would even say that there's genetic mechanisms for learning that are conserved even going back far, far before. But let's go back to the mice and humans question, right? Um, there's a lot of differences. So for one thing, the sensory information is very different. Uh, mice and rats explore the world largely through um, smelling, olfaction, uh, but they also have vision that's kind of designed to kind of catch death from above. So it's like a very big view of the world. And we move our eyes around in a way that focuses on particular spots in space where you get very high resolution from a very limited set of spots in space. So that makes us very different in that way. We also have all these other structures as social animals that allow us to um, respond differently. There's language, there's like, um, you know, so you name it, there's obviously gobs of differences. Humans aren't just giant rats. There's much more complexity to us. Time scales are very important. So primate brains and human brains are especially good at integrating and, um, and holding on to information across longer and longer periods of time, right? And, and also, you know, finally, it's like our history of training data, so to speak, is very, very different than, you know, I mean, a human's world is very different than a wild mo mouse's world. And a lab mouse's world is extraordinarily impoverished relative to an adult human, you know. But still, what can you understand by studying mice? I, I mean, just basic, almost behavioral stuff about memory? Well, yes, but that's very important, right? So you can understand, for instance, how do neurons talk to each other? Right. That's a really big, big question. Neural computation in and of itself, you'd think it's the most simple question, right? Not at all. I mean, it's a big, big question. And understanding how 
two parts of the brain interact, meaning that it's not just one area speaking. It's not like, you know, it's not like Twitter where one area of the brain is shouting and then another area of the brain is just stuck listening to this crap. It's like they're actually interacting on a millisecond scale, right? How does that happen? And how do you regulate those interactions, these dynamic, you know, um, interactions? We're still figuring that out, but that's going to be coming largely from model systems that are easier to understand. Um, you can do manipulations like drug manipulations to manipulate circuits and, and you know use viruses and so forth and lasers to turn on circuits that you just can't do in humans. So I think there's a lot that can be learned from mice. There's a lot that can be learned from non-human primates. And then there's a lot that you need to learn from humans. And I think, um, unfortunately, some of the uh, people in the National Institutes of Health think you can learn everything from the mouse. It's a, like, why study memory in humans when I could study learning in a mouse? And, and just like, oh my God, I'm going to get my funding from somewhere else. So, 